out into uh, further training and education in the workplace. Um, so we'll start tonight with Errol Considine. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks for coming along. Hope I don't get gonged. Uh, go too long. I'll try to keep it within time. Um, I left Hale School in 1968 and started at the WA Newspapers as a cadet on the 4th of January 69. Uh, the world has obviously changed a little bit in the media since then, uh, particularly recently. But there are some, th there are, well, there are many differences. There are some things that remain the same. I'll talk about those shortly. My nearly 50 years uh, in the communications area allowed me to do some amazing things and meet some amazing people and have some amazing experiences. I think that's true, still true today. For example, in 2002, I followed a guy called Steve Fossett around the world in his hot air balloon in a private jet and went to places like Tahiti and Easter Island and a James Bond type base in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, guys with machine guns around us. Uh, in 1975, I was in South Africa, um, got arrested by state security. My editor got put on trial for some stories I'd written. Um, I started in London, the first daily satellite news feed to Australia. Sounds a dark age as it was, I guess. It was exciting, big stuff at the time. Um, I started the first hour news bulletin in Perth on television. And in 1994-95, I created the name Western Derby and helped launch the biggest sports event in WA. Travelled all over the world. Um, in the corporate world, helped people save their reputations and save some companies from ruin. Not to, I'm not doing this to big note myself, just to try and illustrate the range of doors that can open through uh, the media, or as I prefer to call it now, really communications, because media now, when I first started, was really newspapers, radio and television. You can see by the people here tonight and some of the things you'll hear about, the media now is so much more and so much broader, and it all crosses over uh, so in so many different areas. How did I start to pursue my, my career? I had no idea what I wanted to do towards the end of school. Did some tests with a career counsellor. He said, uh, I was always had good marks in English, history and geography. He said, law, teaching or journalism. Uh, I've always been, always been a news junkie, even then. So I decided to give that a go. In those days, um, there was an ad in the paper. Applications are open. You wrote a letter. If you passed that test, you got called in for an interview, which really was a, a general knowledge test. Uh, because journalists have to really know a little about a lot. So you can be called on to cover anything. So wide general knowledge and interest across the sphere of politics, sport, whatever, is really important uh, and remains so today. Um, there was then a, an interview with a panel of editors. If you passed that test, you were then put onto the course. We had about 25 to 30 cadets then, uh, of which I think three quarters were from private schools, which sort of said something about the times as well. Um, different today. Today, uh, then it was male dominated, now in so many areas, public relations, the area I ended up in, is completely female dominated. So for you guys, that sort of gigs are harder one to get into now because women are so strong in that area. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, it's the way it is. Uh, and it's opened up and made a, a much more interesting and, and wider scope of all those industries. I moved into television. Uh, those days, print journalists looked down on television. It was considered a bit inferior, but I decided to have a go there. Uh, in those days, just rang up a mate who worked there, had two days trial, and I had a job. Much easier than what it is now. Um, for all young reporters, the dream was to work on Fleet Street in London. So I went off and worked in South Africa for a while, and then in London, didn't get the Fleet Street job, but got a job with the world's biggest TV news agency. Came back to Perth. In 86, I'd just been appointed news editor of Channel 9, and the station was taken over by a guy called Alan Bond. And I was pulled into the head office and said, you, into the boss's office and said, you've got a new job, you start Monday, you're in Bond Corporation doing PR. So that, another door opened. So really, there was no master plan. It was just get in, work hard, build your professional reputation, make contacts, make connections, and seize opportunities as they arose. And again, I don't think that, that, that's changed too much. So I said, the, I prefer the, the, the word communications to media because it's, it's so much more today than what it was then. The good news is communications is really the biggest industry in the world, uh, bigger than resources in, in, in agriculture or industry. You think of Google, Facebook, Hollywood Studios, Sony Music, all these guys here in the music areas. As I said, it all crosses over. And to me, it's all part of 
the same. And, and some of those jobs and journalism is a great introduction to many of those different areas where you can start in journalism and, and move elsewhere into some of those. The bad news is um, the pathways into the media, traditional media particularly, it, are a lot harder today. Um, I don't have the hands-on experience now. Mark Malibu from the West here will be a lot more aware of, the, of how tough that is to get that start that, that we got comparatively relatively easily, the foot in the door. There are less jobs uh, in many areas because of the uh, disruption from media, which has um, destroyed a lot of the revenue models previously. Um, and I say, you're fighting a, an area w in a lot of the industries now where the guys haven't got the upper hand anymore. So you have to, you have to battle harder to get that, that start. Um, technology has had massive impacts in the way you work in those media er areas. For example, in television, when I first started, Television, the first video cameras were large, heavy, and very expensive. And they needed a cameraman and an operator, and the edit suite was worth a couple of million dollars. Now, of course, people can do it in their telephone. Um, and some in some country areas, small areas, the, the journalist will actually shoot the video, do the interviews, and edit the stories, uh, because it's all about cost saving and efficiency. So that, that's all changed uh, considerably. Um, the other massive change, I think, is, is the domination of, of, of pictures and imagery um, and, and all those the production values that go with that uh, and how stories can get massive traction in a very short space of time uh, with the right image. Sure, the, spoke of the written word, the spoken word, still incredibly important um, and, and the basis of it, but now the imagery is, is worth so much more and there's so much more impact. Um, the bedrock skills, which I think still remain important, um, despite the, the change in character and nature of it, are you a good writer, is, a, is obviously a starting point. Do you like writing? Do you have a passion and hunger for storytelling? Are you competitive? Do you enjoy hard work? News cycles 24-7, long hours at times, very long hours. Do you have the, the, the gall and the front to actually impose yourself on situations and ask hard questions when you may not be welcome? Um, you can't be, be too embarrassed too easily to be in the media. Um, I saw a thing recently with Geraldine Doog, a very famous journalist. She started the year after me at the West and said, one of the things you need to, what makes a good journalist, should be a bit of a busybody and a bit of a gossip. Uh, and that's still true. The word that I think, uh, for my finishing point is, which I think is, is really essential to journalists, is curiosity. Are you curious about the world? Are you, do you... Are you interested in all sorts of things in the world? Are you inquisitive? Do you, do you want to seek out answers? Uh, who, where, when, what, why? Still the basis of those information. When you get in the PR area, um, the same things apply. Um, what does my client need uh, in the form of information to achieve what they need to achieve? Uh, how can they talk to the people they need to reach and communicate? How do I mould the message to make that communication effective? In a world of fake news and disinformation, a very different world, very challenging world, very dangerous world in, that, in the communications area, I think the, the, the demand, the requirement and the essential nature of media um, in truth-telling and making sense of the world still remains as important, perhaps more important than ever. So bottom line, um, the pathways in are harder. Um, technology enables some people to, to go out outside now the mainstream media and forge your own, your own way in using technology. Um, the rewards are still there, but it's a tougher gig than when I started. Thank you. Interesting position to be uh, talking after such an eloquent talker, but I'll give it a go. Um, so I graduated uh, a lot more recently um, and I've just finished my degree at WAPA where I pursued uh, jazz music as a vocalist and uh, went on to do my honours there as well. So my current career, I'm, I'm currently performing as a singer, as a saxophonist and a pianist and I'm also teaching a lot, which also includes teaching at Scotch, which has been a, a large... Uh, emotional quandary for me to be teaching at a, uh, an oppositional school, but uh, I'm doing what I can until I can come back to Hale. Um, 
it, it's been very interesting coming at it uh, now with mentors who have gone through very different uh, technological and uh, job-based challenges or lack thereof. Uh, talking more specifically about university, I had tutors who talk about getting their jobs purely by knowing a guy and, and that person having a job there and just being like, hey, do you want to come teach this? And with zero qualifications, they took their job and have remained in those positions for 40 odd years. Um, whereas for my generation, I find it a lot harder because there is that expectations of you need five years experience, but you've only had three years to get them, but you still need those five years of experience. Um, and so I find it really draws upon the whole idea of you need to know people and be a very personal, very approachable social socialite, if you will, so that when it comes to that point of going for an interview or, or going to uh, work in a band or a school, you know someone there that either has the ear of the person you're interviewing with, is the person you're interviewing with, or says enough about you and knows enough about you to bring that influence to the job because we are coming in to the workforce at a, a lot younger age and with a lot more experience but a lot more hardships to get to the jobs and so it's all about the people you know and so I was very fortunate with Scotch that through my time at Hale I'd, I'd made connections with the now head of music there who worked at Kerry and we did a collaboration um, with Kerry Baptist and Hale. And so he knew me there. And so I got to the interview and we had a chat and it was, and it was very much a chat. It, was, it wasn't so much an interview as a, a just a, oh, what are you doing these days? Oh, what's happened to these people? Oh, have you talked to these people? Um, wherein it's very important that you're very good at talking to people and being able to interact very naturally, I guess. Um, for myself personally, technology, I can, I can kind of address that in a few areas. So I I'm, I'm main, mainly identify as a performer. Um, I perform with a few different groups, but that, that's where my sole interest is. There's teaching, I love teaching and I love to, I, I'm really enjoying the ability to uh, try and mold younger generations and giving them the same opportunities that I was given and, and the same vision and, and joy, I guess, in music and, and the arts in general. Um, and so for myself, performing wise, I find technology is something that is both there and not there. It's all about whether or not you want to be using it. And I, I feel that's potentially the case with more the art side of things is that there will always be the forward thinking progressive movements. But in the same scenario, there will always be the people who are happy with what music was, what what it was in this particular stage, really liked that and that is their niche, that is what they do. And so uh, there is uh, there is a necessity for, for using that technology and, and pushing the boundaries in that sense, but also th there's not a need for you to be that person and there's, there's no there's no need for every musician to be using all the technology available, whether or not it's 20,000 years in the future or 10 years in the past, all music is still relevant at the current point. In saying that, the advancements of technology in music composition are amazing from Sibelius, where you're just composing on your standard scores to a whole barrage of other programs that I'm sure other people will potentially talk about and have a lot more experience in than myself. In terms of teaching, I find that technology is potentially, again, playing a large part in the development. Like there's a lot more online interaction and there's a lot more ability to uh, do away with the face-to-face -face interaction. But at the same time, I do believe that people still hold on to that. Like there is the, the ability for uh, the advancement of technology to take over the workplace, but I don't think that the personability of the job allows that to still be the case, if that makes sense. In short, music is really fun. Technology is always relevant, but you choose what you use. Thank you.
I apologize. Oh, there you go. My voice is wonderful tonight. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm a 12 year veteran of Hale, so um, yeah, that was, that's great. Um, I, um, John Inverarity, who of course uh, the music drama centre is named after, changed my life in the sense that um, I didn't benefit from the music and drama centre. It came two years after I left, but um, he changed the course of the school, which enabled me to study music and. Um, I've never had a, a plan, but I studied pipe organ here. Our first world private school is that. Um, but then I, but I never really knew what I wanted, so I studied that and music education at UWA. Um, I always enjoyed composition, but um, uh, we had disagreements about how people should compose. They they liked stuff that sounded awful, and I didn't, so I decided not to compose at UWA. Um, I didn't realise until I thought about it today, actually, how the Hale contacts helped get me started. So I think if you have networks in the school, um, I think everything that was just said is really important. Um, uh, I got into theatre through, uh, I composed my first music for theatre for school productions once I'd left. Um, I got into mu arranging at uh, UWA through a friend who was in the UWA Dramatic Society. Um, and then Matt Lutton, who I don't know if, if anyone in theatre would have heard of him, but uh, the head of Malthouse Theatre in Melbourne, I was his composer while he was in WA and I've done some shows with him in Melbourne as well. But um, he's an exceptional talent and because I had that Hale connection, he's from Hale, so we, we that's how I got started in the higher end theatre. Um, so I think uh, even in the arts, making those connections with people uh, who who went to your school can be really important. Um, <coughs> I, I think um, I made it very... I wanted to stay in Perth. Almost everyone I went to uni with, went to wherever with, has gone overseas or to Melbourne or Sydney. Um, it's almost in the arts, you almost have to go to Melbourne or Sydney. You're not allowed to stay in Perth. Well, I, d I wanted to stay in Perth, not, not just because I'm boring, but also because I think um, I really, there's a lot of value in Perth. In the last, fift I, I got my first pro TV gig in 2015. Um, I won't tell you how I got there because it's all finished now. Whatever I told you doesn't exist. So I can't help you do that. <laughs> However, um, uh, uh, I, the last 15 years, Perth has really grown. And I'm pleased that I've been a prominent part of that in the composition side of things. Um, I've done a lot of TV documentaries, a lot of dramas, um, way too many short films, features I don't want to talk about. But the reason I'm probably here is that two weeks ago, uh, WA Symphony Orchestra recorded a score for an upcoming uh, animated feature I'm doing. It's going to be out next year called 100% Wolf. So that's probably why we I made this connection at Hale uh, now. Um, but yeah, to have w uh, Wasso play my music at the uh, two days of intense r uh, scoring at the uh, uh, Music and Drama Centre was, was pretty incredible. Um, and the fact that the school helped that to happen also, I think, was in large part due to Ollie, but also I think being an old boy for 12 years, I was like, can we make this happen, guys? Come on. Um, so, yeah, I think Perth is not a bad place to be right now. There's a lot of shooting going on here. There's a lot of um, work for people in pre-production and in the production. And post-production, as soon as people from Sydney or Melbourne come over here, they come back. Fighting that perception that Perth sucks um, mm -hmm. is something we do every week. But I guarantee you, every director I've worked with here who's come here, they've gone, why do I have to use a Perth composer? Why do I have to use a Perth mixer? They come back without any problem at all. Um, so if you want to stay and you know help build Perth, there is absolutely a market for that. Um, technology uh, is vital to what I do. Um, he's right, networking is vital. If you can work a room, you will succeed. I've seen mates who can work a room and they are doing amazing things. I'm, not, I'm a composer. I don't work a room. So uh, we composers like the darkness. We like being in our studio. Someone turns on a light, we retreat to the corner. Um, <laughs> So how do you do it? Well, quality of work is one thing. You still have to be able to communicate. So learning in particular how people who don't understand music, how you communicate with them. So if you study music and you want to be a composer or anything to do with that, game, games are massive. When I grew up, you wanted to be a, f a film composer. Now everyone in the world wants to be a game composer. Um, yeah, they really do. <laughs> so if you're a composer, you want to be a game composer. Um, I'd say... Uh, Focus on, you have to love what you do. If you want to be a game composer, you can't just be, oh, I've played a game once, yeah, it was fine, I'm, I'm going to be a game composer. If you want to be a film composer, you can't, you've got to love film. If you, nobody wants to do theatre, you, you have to love the, that and develop the craft in its unique, because every single one has its challenges. If anyone is interested in that, I can talk to you. There are some fundamental differences in each craft, and I've 
done yeah theatre, film, TV, games. So I know you know the differences in each in each field. Um, technology enabled me to become where I am. Um, uh, I was the first person in Perth to use the latest orchestral software. I made it, you know, before it was MIDI and it sounded pretty average. So for me, I was like, I don't want to sound average, I want to sound good. Um, so I spent almost all my money on the software to make myself sound good. So when that happened, uh, no one else in Perth was doing it, I got noticed straight away. Now, almost anyone can make it sound good. So you guys are living in a completely different age. In a sense, it's, um, it's almost too egalitarian. So anyone, there are many things you can hold down a patch and it'll sound good. Doesn't mean you know how to score. Doesn't mean you know how to interact with a game. Doesn't mean you understand the, the craft of theatre or anything that you're interested in. So I'd say um, it's hard being a composer and often you don't want to be social. Often you just want to be in your room. But he's right that the contacts are absolutely vital. If you're mates with people, chances are one of them might succeed. A whole bunch of my mates have, uh, are doing really well right now who I, I met in film early on. Um, but learn the craft about the area that you're specifically interested in. Facebook, join groups about game composing or whatever you're interested in. There is gr a group for everything, as you guys know way better than I do. But the tips you can learn off those are immeasurable. Um, but just be aware that, you know, but last thing will be having a sound. People are after a sound right now. If I have a weakness, it's that I've had to do too many things um, and I don't have a sound per se. So if you have a sound and you pursue that sound and you understand the craft as well, not just the sound, um, then that's, I'd say, a really uh, strong foundation to move into the area that you want to move into. Um, but look, yeah, things have changed dramatically. So, but I do, well I, well, I think recounting my own future, well, past, <laughs> won't be particularly useful. I certainly do understand uh, where things are now. So, yeah, feel free to talk to me about that if you're interested. Thanks. such eloquent speakers. I don't tend to speak in front of people too often, so bear with me. Um, I graduated Hale in 2006 um, and basically pursued as much as I could about music while I was here. Um, and I'm now teaching at two private girls' schools, um, Iona and actually uh, the sister school, St. Mary's, which is a real, a real privilege. Um, so I think in terms of thinking about my own career, it really started at Hale, and I think a lot of the opportunities that I've been able to go on to do uh, to do in both original music and in teaching work stemmed from my time here. Um, I got myself involved in every single music ensemble I could, um, including the barbershop, <laughs> um, which I didn't really add a cursory interest in, but I decided to pursue it anyway. <laughs> um, and I think one thing that was really important about that was that I feel like in the creative industry, you are always in a position to prove yourself to other people. You want to prove that you are hardworking. You want to prove that you are assertive and uh, caring as well. So I think taking an attitude of uh, feeling like there's always someone to prove yourself to, I think is an important part of pursuing the creative industries. Um, I then went on to Whopper and did my first year in jazz. Um, and quickly realized that jazz was absolutely not my bag. Uh, so I kind of had this interesting uh, <laughs> and kind of squirrely time through university and had to do a little bit of self-discovery in that respect. So it's, it's cool to see that Reese kind of pursued that uh, more deeply than I did. Um, so I moved into contemporary music. And for me, um, the original music thing was always something that I had a deep passion for. And I wanted to find a way to pursue original music but also be able to sustain myself because obviously in the creative world and when we have our own passions we have to self-fund those passions and it can be quite hard to make that work sometimes so my goal really was to find a way to fund this other part of my life which is a financial expense but is the most at least for me the most important thing in my life which was pursuing the original music scene so I eventually moved from doing gigs in my early career to in terms of cover work um, and wedding gigs, stuff that actually pays, you know, the, the actual money um, and moved into teaching because it made more sense to me to spend my time doing that. It's financially very good and it's uh, very flexible too. So it allowed me the time that I needed in order to uh, commit to all of the original work that I was doing. So I had a bit of a weird time kind of navigating the, the music world and I think you know um, as a as a general statement I think 
this happens more often than you would expect, that it's not a matter of uh, knowing exactly what you want at the very beginning. It's sort of a matter of navigating it. Um, so I've been able to perform globally in original bands um, and I've been able to self-fund that, which has been really good. Um, so the way that the original, the original music thing happened for me was I started playing in original bands when I was 13 and it was just with friends. It was just a, a matter of rehearsing every weekend and really loving the process of just creating music with friends. Then it became a more serious thing. So that involved a lot of networking. And that same concept that I mentioned before about uh, feeling like you've always got something to prove at all times really happens a lot in the uh, original music scene where you don't know who you're meeting. You could meet the person who asks you to audition for their band. And that's exactly what happened to me. I ended up playing a gig with uh, Voyager, which is the band I'm now in, uh, supporting them. And then I befriended the members of the band just through hanging out with them. And then they asked me to audition years later. I was already well practiced and um, you know managed to prove to them that I was able to play their music. <laughs> um, so they asked me to join. And now I've been able to uh, travel the world and play music all over the place. Um, so yeah, there's always that element of trying to prove yourself at any any point in time. Um, in terms of the technological stuff, from a teaching perspective, I feel like uh, teaching guitar and bass has been, uh, <coughs> technology has benefited the students in a, in a lot of ways. I think YouTube is uh, obviously an amazing resource and allows <coughs> students to absorb whatever they want to absorb. And I feel like students are now more aware of music generally. Um, when I was growing up, it was sort of a matter of my bass teacher throwing me a CD to listen to and I had to then go and transcribe it. But now we have YouTube, which you can slow down the audio and really get into the nitty gritties and analyze things really well. Um, but as a teacher as well, I think uh, having a better oral skill set is really important for that reason because a lot of students want to self-navigate the arts and want to learn what they want to learn and so I want to be able to facilitate their learning. So for me, having the ability to transcribe music on the fly, either in lessons or in your spare time in order to teach the material they want to learn is really important. So if you're already involved in music, I think um, upping your oral skills is a really important part of, of all of that. Now, in terms of the original music stuff, uh, technology, it's all about social media. And I personally both find it useful and loathsome at the, f at the same time. I think it's the thing that affects my mood personally the most. Um, and I think the thing to be, to be aware of is that you should try to view social media as a tool to get your music to more people. Don't use it as a tool to compete with other people because that will absolutely drive your mood into the dirt. Um, <laughs> so this is, this is a really important thing because I've, I've found myself at the mercy of viewing it as like a competitive exercise when in reality all I'm trying to do is get my music to more people. Um, so I'll just leave you on that note that yeah, be, be aware that social media is a great tool but also be aware that um, it can be very detrimental to your personal and mental health. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was uh, asked here as a as an entrepreneur, and um, being as unfocused on career and titles as I am, I had to call my partner, who's interstate at the moment, and said, "What does an entrepreneur wear? What do they look like?" So, this apparently is her approximation of what an entrepreneur might look like. <laughs> um, so, as everybody else in this room is, I'm a hail boy, and was presented a lot of opportunities whilst at school, some of which I took. Um, I'd considered medicine and the Air Force and engineering commerce as three really good options. And then much to my parents' delight, I went and did music after school. Um, I did a year of music and I completely failed music history. I got 0% in fact for that because I didn't turn up to the exams. And this is probably my first clue at the power of relationships and persuasion because I had a little chat with my, uh, the head of my course, Mark, and he passed me after a little half hour conversation um, because he agreed with me, with me that the lecture was just dead boring and uh, I didn't need to do it. So uh, I didn't actually come back to music after he passed me and I switched out into 
sound engineering, so I thought that might be quite interesting. I was teaching clarinet and piano at a few schools at the time. I passed the course at SAE and, uh, and ended up doing my friend's parties. I did a few little gigs here with some bands. I was even writing some music with Ash at one stage, playing squash with him as well. Um, I, I wasn't really having what you would call a career. It was more an experience, which is probably the way I've lived my entire life. I've just been having one experience after the other. So when I was 24, 25, I decided, well, let's go and have another experience. And I flew to England with 600 bucks and didn't know anyone. Um, I moved down to the southwest and walked into a theatre and, uh, and said, can I work for you? And they said, what do you do? I said, I don't really know. What do you need me to do? <laughs> and, uh, and so this, this lovely lady, Sheila, she yelled upstairs to the, to the manager and said, Mark, there's an Australian here for you. And, uh, and he's, he's yelled down, what does he want? A job. And uh, he said, can you start now? So I ended up working for free for a weekend and they offered me a full-time role on the Monday. Um, I guess what was becoming clear to me at this stage was that I really liked developing relationships. So I loved the conversations that I was having with staff. I ended up managing quite a few staff while I was in the UK and going on some tours. And uh, whilst I was there, I was called up by Hale and, and they said, do you want a job? So I said, yeah, I'll, I'll come back. I'm sick of the weather. And so I was back at Hale for 10 years. Um, so I've, I've never applied for a job in my life. I've never sat a job interview in my life. I wouldn't know what to tell you about having a career or a job. Um, <laughs> other than that, I've been so focused on what makes me happy. Um, and that's really important to me. And it's actually fostered a lot of success um, sort of into my 30s. So, so now I'm, um, I've just found myself involved with this business um, as a, one of four partners. Uh, since I joined nine months ago, we've increased our staff from six to 40 people. Um, we manage production in nearly every nightclub in Perth. Um, we have a pyrotechnics arm, so if you've seen fire anywhere, it's probably ours. We're the only Western Australian pyrotechnics company <coughs> that hasn't blown someone up yet. We're very proud of that. Uh, we also have an artist management arm as well. So Eminem, Taylor Swift, Red Hot Chili Peppers we've managed this year. And we've got Elton John and Metallica coming up. So we've got staff that look after them. Um, we're also currently building a theatre at Perth Modern. And hopefully we've got another one in the pipeline as well. Um, so I don't do any of this stuff. I just manage the personalities that do it. So what I've been able to do in this business is probably something that can translate to any industry. Um, but I just like this one because I like blowing things up and I like the variation. So what I do and what I've found that I do quite well is take people and apply them to roles that they really enjoy doing. So I develop them and I find a job for them and I make them happy. So that makes them really productive. It makes them happy in their job. We have really good staff retention. And, um, and that makes the whole business really successful. Um, what technology has done is probably pushed me towards this end because what happened to SAE is I learned on analog sound consoles. And the year after I left, everything went digital. So, <laughs> so I had a few choices. I could retrain um, or I could just get other people to do the work for me that were younger and better. So that's kind of been my focus throughout my role as a manager or a director is find people that can do things better than I can. Um, and I think sometimes being a manager, there's a bit of a hubris that is associated with it. People try to employ people that perhaps they can control, but I love it when people can do my job better than I can. Um, it means that I have more time to develop other people, to get more work, um, to go and have new experiences. So. Again, on technology, we actually can't function without technology. We are such a lean business that we have apps that do everything for us. We do have apps that do our accounting. I can um, pull out my phone at the moment. I can tell you which documents all my staff are working on. Um, I can pull out my phone during shifts, and I can tell you exactly where my staff are because they can't sign on to their shift um, without being on site because it's geofenced. Um, we have and that out outputs their timesheets to payroll, and payroll just does it automatically. So we've got 
no one in those roles. So technology, if my phone turned off, I probably wouldn't know what to do. I would just stand in the same spot until someone charged my phone for me. Um, so that's, that, I guess, another way that technology has really affected our business. We would still function, but we would be a, we'd have a lot more people doing jobs with us. Um, at the moment, we can be quite lean. So I suppose, to summarise, um, and this is a very non-linear career progression, <laughs> I, I understand that. Um, what I found is that by doing what makes me happy and by finding roles for people to make them happy, I have found some success, but an enormous sense of satisfaction. I love coming to work. I love seeing all my staff. I love talking to them. I love being around them. Um, and I just love my job. Thanks. <laughs> Um, hi, so I'm Mark um, and I work at the West Australian newspaper where I'm the deputy editor and I've really got the most ridiculously simple story really um, because uh, I got a job at the West Australian um, straight out of university in 1996 um, and I've been there ever since <laughs> and uh, I like talk about you know like the most linear career you could possibly have I'm like the opposite um, of what we've just well, what you've just heard because um, my attitude when I got to that job was uh, someone said to me never you know, if someone asks you to do something like never ever say no because you don't ever know where that opportunity is going to going to end up or where it's going to take you so I landed doing this job and I was like the lowest person in the entire place um, me and six other university graduates, or five others, and uh, they said to me, you know, would you like to be a news reporter? Yeah, sure, I'd love to do that. That sounds fantastic. Did that for a little while. Would you like to go to Canberra and be a political reporter? Yeah, that sounds fantastic. I'm interested in politics. I'll go and do that. Would you like to be the chief of staff and boss around all the other reporters? Well, who's going to say no to wanting to do that? Yeah, sure, I'll do that. Then I was asked, do you want to get into the production side of, of newspapers, which is the people that get all the stories, all the words, all the photographs, all the cartoons? Do you want to be the person that gets all that stuff and puts it into what is visibly looks like a newspaper? Yeah, I'll give, I'll give that a crack. So I've done that. And uh, then I was asked, uh, do you want to be the features editor? Uh, yeah, I'll have a go at that. And um, now I've ended up being the... Um, now I've ended up being the deputy editor, so 23 or 24 years later. So when I um, finished Hale, um, I didn't have the foggiest idea really what I wanted to do, um, other than go to university and study something. And I was quite academically inclined, so that made to me made an enormous amount of sense that I'd go and do that. Didn't really know what I wanted to study, um, but, um, I had some good advice. So all, all my friends studied commerce at UWA. So when it came time for me to fill out the form, what's your number one choice? Uh, UWA, commerce at UWA just became my automatic uh, default position. So I did that and um, then I thought, oh, I might apply for law because I know some people that are, are studying law. And I got into law and did that for, that's like a four year degree and never really gave, there was never to me a link between the studying of the law and the being the lawyer. To me, it was a lot of fun studying it. It was very, very interesting. Um, I had friends that were studying it too. So I found it uh, an interesting uh, intellectual sort of exercise, but I didn't really ever see myself becoming a lawyer. Certainly would never have ruled it out, but it wasn't something that I was desperately wanting to do. I'm certainly not like those people that you hear about that, you know, since the age of seven, they always wanted to be like a fighter pilot or something, you know, something like that. I was just a generalist. Um, I didn't want to kind of pigeonhole myself too much. I didn't want to go too specialised into anything because I thought that might limit my options. So I just wanted to keep it nice and broad. I just wanted it to be interesting. Um, I've got a curiosity about the world. So I just wanted something that I would find intellectually 
stimulating, wouldn't tie me down too much and came to the end of being at university, kind of had to think about getting a job. Um, and one thing I'd always liked growing up was journalism and particularly reading newspapers. And my dad worked in the city and every afternoon he'd bring home a copy of the Daily News and some people will remember what that is. <laughs> and if he didn't bring home the Daily News, I'd be really annoyed with him and I'd berate him and say, you know, why didn't you bring home the paper? He'd say, oh, I got too busy or, you know, I had to do something else. I didn't, I didn't see a paper boy to buy, be able to buy one. So I was, you know, I was really quite, I was quite hooked on, on that newspaper and um, used to really absorb all the stories, um, used to love the layout. Um, you know, in hindsight, it was a pretty easy read, that newspaper. Um, it was not never supposed to be too intellectually challenging. It was pretty racy. So, you know, for my teenage brain, it really, really appealed to me. And um, I, had some f I had a friend who had become a cadet at the West Australian newspaper. And uh, as some people have said to you tonight, it's often um, not what you know, but who you know. So I rang up this person and said, look, wouldn't mind pursuing the same thing that you're doing you know have have you got an idea about how I might go about it so I got some inside information about who I needed to speak to set up a meeting went and saw the person who was in charge of employing the graduates found out what they required and found out that what you have to do if you want to be a journalist is you need to do a bit of journalism but they do expect you uh, to have an, a bit of an established track record you know volunteering here or there writing articles um, putting yourself forward to do all sorts of work experience. And as I said, I hadn't really put too much thought into pursuing a career at this point, and, uh, but it became clear to me that that would be something that I would do. So towards the end of university, I went and did work experience at the West Australian, and I reckon I was probably the oldest person there because mostly it was like high school kids that were doing the work experience. But it's what you had to do. So I spent a week of that... Um, uh, got to know some of the people around the office and uh, fortunately enough um, then said I'd apply for a, a cadetship. Now, back in the day, um, the West Australian had a very formal um, employment program and they would take university graduates only. They took groups of about six or so, although previously they'd gone up to groups of about 30. It's pretty highly competitive. There's a whole series of tests that you need to do. As Errol mentioned, there was a spelling test, general knowledge test. There was a spatial reasoning test. This is all paper-based testing. Then you'd have a first interview, and then if you were lucky enough, you'd get through to a second interview. Uh, and you know, as it happened, I jagged it through um, and, uh, and got the job. And um, yeah, I've been there. I've been there ever since, doing a whole range of different things within the newspaper. Um, uh, as far as like getting employment in newspapers is concerned, I think, I reckon I was just very, very lucky um, in hindsight. I don't think anyone would be able to sail through like that anymore. These days there is an expectation um, for people who want to get into the media that they go and do some sort of, well, in fact, a whole series of volunteer work, um, working on weekends, doing shifts that no other one, no other person wants to fill because, you know, it's the midnight, it's the graveyard shift. And um, they do jobs all over the sort of, all over the place. They go out to the bush, they work in places that no one ever wants to go and move to. Um, but they're demonstrating to um, employers that they really, they want it really badly. Like, so they don't, they're not just like in love with the idea of journalism and working in the media, but they're actually prepared to go and do the hard yards. And that's pretty much how journalism works these days. And don't believe what people say to you if they say there's no jobs, there's no jobs in the media anymore. As an industry, we've been completely smashed by technology. Um, we've been smashed probably, you know, second only to the recorded music industry when Napster destroyed that industry. Um, but still, people love reading the news. People still like watching the news. People are still interested in what goes around around the world, so there'll always be jobs for people who are those storytellers who um, get out there and file those stories and do those TV reports and do those radio reports. Um, it's just a lot harder. 
technology, as I said, it's caused massive dislocation to industry. Um, it's also um, broken down, though, a lot of the, the barriers, a lot of the um, divisions between the media. So traditionally there was like newspapers and radio and TV. Now these days, like on the internet, anyone can publish anything. So a newspaper can do podcasts and a newspaper can do video and a TV station can run a website and a TV station can also have text-based reports uh, on a website. So there's been huge amount of, um, of this bringing together of the various skills in journalism across the board, regardless of which, um, uh, you know, which traditional media you work for. Um, as far as like the skills of the actual journalists, <laughs> like when I was a journalist, when I was doing my training, I was all print. So I didn't really care about anything else other than print. I didn't have to take any photographs. I didn't have to take any video. But these days, everyone's got an iPhone. So if a reporter's at court and the, and the accused person walks past you, these days you're expected to get out your iPhone, take some pictures, take some video, get it posted up on the website as soon as possible. Um, these days, like as a newspaper, we produce podcasts. So generally guys that are just scribblers writing sports stories, now they do podcasts. Uh, we do uh, like our own version of like a TV station, so people do video as well. And the other big thing that I thought would be worth mentioning is things of the world's really sped up massively. So there used to be set print deadlines and newspapers would have like a 6 p.m. deadline and a 10 p.m. deadline and you spend your whole day working up to those deadlines. But these days it's completely changed. People want the news as soon as the news breaks. They don't want to wait to get their newspaper on the front lawn. And that's completely changed the way the journalists work because we expect people to file their stories immediately and then to keep filing during the day, updating the stories, and then even to uh, file a different story, version of their story for the newspaper that's a bit different, a bit fresh for the morning so that you're giving readers something different. So. Um, the technology has revolutionised the industry, but it's still a lot of fun and there are still plenty of jobs out there. Matthew, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm Matthew. I graduated from Hale in 2011. Um, probably by the time I started Year 11 at Hale, I knew that I wanted to pursue a career in visual arts. Um, so I spent the next two years at Hale spending most of my afternoons when I wasn't playing sport in the art department working on paintings for my visual arts unit. Um, and because I knew what I wanted to do, I had basically put my preferences for every visual arts course there was in, in Perth. Um, at the time, unfortunately, UWA had stopped their, their visual arts course um, as they had a restructure. So it came between Curtin University and ECU. Um, after going to open days, Curtin University seemed like the best way to go. Um, so I started there in 2012 um, and it was a big shock, I think. Um, it's the, the kind of education system was just thrown on its head. It was completely different to, to high school. Um, it was the self-directed learning, the, the um, expectation that as, a, as an art student, you would um, kind of discover what you were interested in and then pursue that. And that kind of progressed every year, second year it became more about certain projects and in third year it became about big projects. Um, and I guess the idea of that is that it sets you up for when you're an artist outside of university because once you get outside of university, no one's telling you to do anything as an artist. Um, as a visual artist, you want to make a, type of, a certain type of work. You're the, ones that, you're the one that's um, working out what that's going to look like, what that kind of work means, who do you want to see it, where do you want those um, works to be exhibited and so on. Um, while I was kind of at the end of my degree, I wanted to start getting some of my work out there. And as a, in the visual arts, there's a number of emerging artists kind of awards and prizes. So by the time I was in third year, I started um, entering some of those awards. Um, I was lucky enough to win one in 2014 when I was in third year, which was the South Perth Emerging Art Prize. And that really helped to um, get my work out to people who are already in the industry, um, curators that were working at the Art Gallery of WA, um, senior staff members at universities. Um, and I guess a lot of that is back to what some other points have been tonight about, you know, getting to, to network in your industry, getting to know people. Um, while I said that art often is self-directed, there are still people who look to curate exhibitions. They, they contact artists. They're interested in, in um, 
certain ways of making art and, and contact you um, to be a part of that. So it's definitely important to, to get yourself out there. Once I finished undergrad, I decided I needed a break from formal education to get out of the institution for a bit. Um, so I took a year off. Um, I kind of saw two purposes for that. One was just to get some life experience, to travel, to work a little bit, but also to, to kind of dabble in the visual arts field um, to see what could happen in that, in that year off. So I applied for a residency at Fremantle Arts Centre. Um, I got that residency and I saw that as an opportunity to develop work and apply for a, a, my first solo exhibition at a small uh, gallery, which is no longer running, unfortunately, free range gallery in the city. Um, and that helps give me the confidence to go, yes, this is what I want to do, but I'm also not quite ready to be doing it full time. And the back of my mind, I'd always thought about doing a little bit more study. Um, and for me, the logical next step was honours, which is a, a focused year and it's one project. Um, it's in two parts. It's a creative body and it's a 5,000 word exegesis, um, kind of linking your, your theory and your ideas, materials and the, the work itself. And so I've finished my honours in 2016 and from that point I was like, yep, this is what I want to do. Um, and I guess the next step was how do you, how do you make that work? Um, being an artist is, a, is what I call a slow game. It doesn't happen quickly. It's not a financially rewarding industry. Um, you're not doing it to make a lot of money. You're doing it because it's, you, you love it. You want to um, engage with people. You want to change perceptions of things. You want to talk about issues, politics, history, um, the environment, things like that. So for me, um, I had to come up with a way to, to kind of subsidise, I suppose, my art practice. Uh, when I first finished honours, it was very much about just getting a job um, straight away. So I was slinging coffees as a lot of recent graduates are doing. Um, but at the same time, I was getting myself out there. And I'd met a, a curate, the collection manager at John Curtin Gallery, which is Curtin University's um, art gallery. And not long after I graduated, I got in touch saying that I'd finished and that I was looking for work. And non not long after that, they were looking for someone. So I had an informal interview. Um, and by April, after graduating, the year before, I was working back at Curtin, working in um, the John Curtin Gallery. And so I've been there now for two and a half years, um, and that's been three days a week. And it's been a, a great way to kind of balance work, having some income, not on a huge amount of income, but enough still to pay my bills and give me time to focus on my art practice. So those last two and a half years, I've been... Um, getting my work out there as much as I can. Um, I have a studio in, uh, in Fremantle in a not-for-profit business called ArtSource. Um, and that, I, I guess that affords me the space and the time to actually be able to go into the studio, make work, um, come up with, I guess, goals for that year. Where do I want to exhibit? What kind of work do I want to make? And setting out to apply for exhibitions. One of the, the big benefits of actually studying visual arts um, is the, the kind of writing ability that you, that you learn through that process. Um, being an artist, is half of it is, is actually making work, the other half is admin. It's applying for exhibitions, it's taking photos of your work, um, writing biographies, writing artist statements. So often it feels like I'm applying for a job all the time, um, even though I'm just trying to get artwork out there. Um, but the idea is that gets easier as you, as you go on. You know, the more you get your work out there, the more curators that see your work, the more galleries that take notice of what you're doing, the more likely you are to get invited to, to show and you know, kind of move your way up, I suppose, the, the art gallery chain. Um, I will talk just briefly a little bit about technology. I guess technology's had two, I guess, major impacts on contemporary art. The first has been the kind of art that people are making now. Um, there's been a big shift into video work, um, animation, being part of visual arts, not you know, just films themselves or animations themselves. So kind of being um, part of the contemporary art world. And then I guess for me, what's more relevant is getting your work out there. And it's a blessing and a, a curse because there's a saturation of artists now. Anyone can be an artist, anyone can be a photographer, they can get their work out really easily. And sometimes that can make it hard to get your work out there. But at the same time, if you do it well and you do get your work out there and it's seen by the right people, you will get opportunities that weren't there before. Um, it also makes it a lot easier being an artist, say in Perth, which is quite an isolated city and has a small contemporary art scene, to get exhibitions in the rest of Australia or internationally. 
last year I had a gallery in Houston, Texas, um, see my work on Instagram and that resulted in being part of the group show there. Um, and it was my first time exhibiting out of Australia, which wouldn't have happened without having a social media presence. So I think, um, if nothing else, if the social media pre presence leads people to a website where you've got in depth, um, kind of history of your practice, what you're working on, um, it goes a long way to getting more opportunities and for building your um, momentum as an artist. Thank you. Three. All right, I think I'm lucky last, um, so I hope you're not too tired. Um, so I was a, a boarder here at Hale, also in Wilson House, um, and hello to the boarding families out there. Um, and I had a really great time at Hale. I think coming from the country, I really appreciated all the opportunities um, that were available here at Hale. Um, and I certainly tried to make the, the most of those. Um, I was doing sports. I was doing the arts um, and theatre programs um, and really just got to, got to do a whole bunch of different things, which I'm really grateful for. Um, and it was actually through a very random opportunity um, on a lunchtime um, talks. Apparently, I just heard that they're still doing those. There was a scholarship offered or oh, discussed um, during one of those for a university in America. Um, and I just sort of went out on a whim. I didn't really know necessarily what I wanted to study, but they had a nice <coughs> general arts um, degree, which enabled me to sort of do a few different things. Um, and it just looked like it really suited me. Uh, it meant I got to go travel. I lived overseas for four years, but I'd, I had no idea if I was going to get it or not. And I just threw my hat in the ring. Um, yeah, it all worked out, um, and I'm really grateful for sort of that opportunity. And it was just, it was just so random. I didn't even know about the talk. One of the teachers just told me to go in there because there wasn't enough people, and they wanted to fill the room. <laughs> <laughs> and it, yeah, it worked out really well. So definitely, you know, I think it was mentioned before. Just take, um, you know, take those opportunities when they do come up. Um, so yeah, when I went to the states originally, I was thinking I might want to be uh, a performer. I was really interested in film. Um, but wanted to sort of go into the, the stage side of things um, just because it's, it's really good for your craft um, and performing on stage is, is really good um, practice even if you did want to go into the film stuff. Um, and then after a couple years I fell in love with photography while I was there as well and did a, a double degree in that. Um, and while I was over there also sort of realised that performing was not what I wanted to do and I moved sort of on the other side of, um, of the stage and into directing and then that sort of transitioned into my photography as well. Um, and being very interested in uh, video work. So uh, I really love hearing um, Ash's comments, I still want to call him Mr. Greg because he was my composition teacher when I was here, <laughs> um, about Perth being a really good place for artists. Um, I, I was actually really glad to come back to Perth after having been away. I had, you know, the rosy movie sort of impression of what the United States was and it just wasn't like that at all. Um, and I was really grateful to be able to come back home and I think appreciated Perth a lot more than I, I did before I left. Um, and was freelancing for a while, doing different things in photography where I realised that I knew nothing about the business side of things. So I would highly encourage anyone thinking about being the arts, also make sure you understand how business works because they are intrinsically linked. Um, they re really don't operate without the other. So you, you kind of have to know a little bit about both. Um, and yeah, I was just sort of freelancing around um, and then ended up uh, working for this foreign investment company, doing my photography stuff, and that turned into a, um, a full-time role. They were based between Perth and Zambia um, and introduced me to a lot of um, PR and communications. I agree as well that I think probably a more, um, a, a better word is probably communications in terms of what a lot of us do, whether it's the music side of things, visual arts, it's, it's all about communicating a story at a, at a basic level. Um, and then I, I was really enjoying that. It enabled me to do a lot of the stuff that I was really enjoying, but um, it wasn't really the work that I wanted to do. So I left that job and applied um, at North Metro TAFE um, for their advanced diploma um, course. So I was a bit of a mature age student there, but um, and also went back to like a diploma after having done a degree. But really it was just to help, um, I guess, solidify my different skills that I had with theatre and photography, put them together into um, video production, um, and also enabled me, enabled me to, to network locally because I'd been away for so long. Um, I didn't sort of have those um, immediate connections and networks, which um, everyone's talked about are really important. So through TAFE, I got to work on some feature films um, here in Perth, which was really exciting. Um, work with some, um, you know, like really interesting actors, a whole bunch of different um, craftspeople, 
um, in film. But I think the biggest takeaway that it got out of all of that, um, and I think something that's important for people to know, is you have to be a multitasker um, and you have to have multi-skills um, to work sort of in the communication space. It's been mentioned a few times with technology and the disruption that sort of happened in the industry. Um, you, you need to be able to do multiple different things, kind of like I said before at the business as well. You need to know how that side of it works. You need to know a little bit about the technology side of it. Um, you need to know about the, the human element, um, how to communicate those stories using those you know, um, technological tools. Um, and yeah, I think that was probably what I got most out of, um, out of my time at TAFE. It was very practical um, and I would really recommend it um, as a course. Um, yeah, then went back sort of into the freelancing world and then eventually got picked up um, with the job that I'm at now um, as a production director for a, a small video department at a, um, a digital marketing agency. Um, so again, we've talked a lot, I've heard a lot tonight about how there's, you know, no jobs potentially or that, you know, there's less jobs or less opportunities. Um, I would probably almost say the opposite. I think there's more opportunities, but you're going to have to make them for yourself. There's not jobs out there that you can just walk into. So you need to sort of really figure out, um, I guess, kind of like what Ash was saying, find your sound, find your voice, um, figure out where in that sort of space you fit, because um, it's not going to be just one sort of niche job anymore. You have to have multiple skills um, and be able to do multiple things in sort of whether it's by yourself as a freelancer or if you're in like an organization um, or a corporate um, sort of environment. Um, so I guess about technology, it's the same kind of thing. I mean, can what we all do is based on technology, whether it's a printing press or it's um, the internet. Um, so some of the exciting things, uh, I guess, in my field that are coming up or well, already here, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality. Uh, we heard a bit about animation. I get so many requests for work um, for animations. And at the moment, a lot of that kind of stuff is just a little bit too expensive or a little bit not quite sophisticated enough. But very soon that will turn on its head and will just be everywhere. There's going to be so many jobs, I think, for animators and people that have those um, technology art-based skills. Um, again, it might not just be a, a single job, but it could be, um, you know, someone who's able to do a lot of different things, um, perhaps for an organization or a company, um, or like I said, even as a, a freelancer. So I think, yeah, you really have to sort of go out there and make those opportunities um, for yourself, because as we said, those old avenues, those old doors just aren't quite there like they used to be, but um, you've got the tools you know, now with technology to sort of take those opportunities for yourself. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much, guys. Uh, if Helen, if I can ask you to take the old boys through to the main administration and then, folks, I'll cap off with a few points and then there's some light supper for everybody to enjoy. Um, do you have your fob? I do. Very good. Um, I think the main thing tonight was it's about connections and networks. Uh, and I, it was just interesting to watch the old boys when they were here before you were here. There, there, there really was a deep connection, that being A, hail, but then obviously being their, their industry. Um, and so I know with the Year 12s, there's an event that we held a couple of weeks ago at lunchtime where we had an old boy who's basic business premise is, is all around marketing on LinkedIn. And so the year 12s, a number of them now have started up a LinkedIn account prior to transitioning out of school. They've connected with the old Halion network. Uh, they've connected with me and they'll go and connect with different people throughout uh, or the areas that they're interested. And I think that social media and using social media in a very specific and targeted way is very important. So it's always very interesting when I stand with or talk with my year nines and it might be about Snapchat or Instagram. Uh, I think you can use those different social media mediums for different purposes. So I'm a bit of a fan of Twitter. So I follow a whole heap of professional stuff through Twitter. I follow a whole heap of more educational type stuff through LinkedIn. And then obviously being old, I still have Facebook. 
um, which is more just for keeping up to date with friends overseas. So that, that notion of communication, I think, is very important. Building connections. I like the point about um, being curious. I think that's really important. Uh, Reese talked about um, having the right mentors. Um, and there are programs within Hale where you can you know, find a mentor or make a connection with a, with a more recent old boy or a young Halian, as they call them. Um, that notion of fun. Uh, boys, school is meant to be fun. I know that we have all this, particularly year 12s, we've got all this high stakes testing. Um, once you transition out at the end, there's many, many different opportunities to get to where you want to go. Um, and I know the ATAR is a, is a fairly sizable thing in the scope of West Australia and education, um, but pretty much at a certain point, once the offers have been made, that, that sort of becomes a little bit redundant. And the majority of you, regardless of the score, will get into something. It just, you have to chase it, okay? And it becomes very important to be proactive in that space, probably from about midway through year 12 at the latest. And if you're really keen, you can start at year 10. Uh, I like that point about uh, you've got to have a can-do attitude. Um, Ollie mentioned a couple of things that I really liked, which were um, focusing on things that make you happy, which leads to fulfilment. And I think, you know, life's in the span of things fairly short. You want to do something that's fulfilling. Uh, and I'll just finish on the last one, that notion of self-directed learning. I think that is really important. Um, there are many, many opportunities at Hale, and sometimes I think b because of all the opportunities, you can feel that it's you know, you get a bit, you're handheld sometimes. Um, you know, really find out what you're interested in, pursue that, because it's it, it's really you about getting be, about getting the best out of yourself. Ultimately, that should be the goal at the end of the day. Um, thanks very much for coming. Main admin, muffins, coffee, tea, juice, all the things that a growing boy needs. And parents too. Thank you very much.